Thank you. Uh, so I'll be talking about modeling mutational patterns from two marginal data. So I'm going to start again by saying that tumors of different patients are heterogeneous. So here you see a, um, a matrix where rows are genes and columns are patients from uh, different cancers, and the different cancers are indicated by colors. Uh, so, okay, you can see that there are few genes like TP53, which are very frequently mutated, so that there's no doubt that they make, um, they, they have a lot of impact on development of cancer. A few other genes can be uh, clustered, so these are uh, indicated in colors, can be clustered with, together with the, uh, with the cancers, so they can be thought of res as responsible for these cancers. But for a lot of genes, uh, we cannot say whether they are important for a specific cancer or not. And these are these ones in gray, uh, very infrequently mutated. Okay? So now the, the first question is, <coughs> the, the first important question that we ask is which mutations are drivers and which are passengers? So this is by standard approaches assessed by this frequency of mutations, but as I said, this doesn't always work, um, or by putting these genes in functional or network con context, by enrichment in known pathways, or by looking at sets of genes and their, their mutations, and by this, finding mutated pathways de novo. <coughs> okay, and now a second question, maybe even more important one, is which of these mutated genes could be exploited for cancer therapy? And now the first obvious answer to that question is, well, the drivers, the ones that we, the, the, the answer to the first question, right? The ones that are important should be maybe targeted. But another answer, which is maybe even more an efficient approach to cancer therapy, is uh, synthetic lethal partners of mutated genes, and not necessarily only driver genes, but any genes that are mutated in cancer patients. Okay, and the reason why these two items are in red is because, first of all, I will be talking about them today, and second of all, because both of these uh, exhibit mutually ex mutual exclusivity patterns in tumor genomic data. Okay, so again, what are mutually exclusive patterns of cancer mutations? Um, so. Uh, you can see such patterns when you in in in, uh, in, uh, in on matrices of gene mutations where you arrange uh, on the one side the tumors and uh, genes uh, on the other. So here are the rows and the columns, and you uh, you, you you see uh, this mutual exclusivity when at most one mutation uh, in the gene set occurs per tumor. So those tumors that show these. Uh, uh, these, this mutual exclusivity, we say they are covered by mutual exclusivity, and if we see violation to that strict definition, then we say we have impurity of mutual exclusive pattern. Okay, so that was, uh, that was actually observed a long time ago that uh, cancer pathways uh, show this mutually exclusive patterns in tumor genomic data. Okay. But why, so I'm going to try to explain why do actually these cancer pathways show mutual exclusivity. So I prepared a small animation to, to, to explain this for you. Okay, so imagine you are given a, a tumor eye and uh, at a specific point in time, uh, genes in, a, in some cancer pathway uh, are not mutated in the, and the uh, cells in this tumor have some, some fitness which is indicated by this red uh, arrow. And now imagine that uh, one of these genes in the cancer pathway gets mutated, and then we make an assumption if you mutate one gene in the pathway, the entire pathway is off, okay? So then, uh, because it's cancer pathway, fitness of such a cell where this happens increases. And then, uh, because of this fitness increase, this mutation in gene one uh, fixates in the population of cells of this tumor. So then, when we take this tumor and we sequence the tumor, we can see this mutation in G1 in tumor I, okay? 
But if we now had in any other cell after that uh, mutations in additional genes, there, there is because the pathway was already off, there is no or slight fitness increase. So these mutations do not fixate in the population, and we don't see them. Okay. Now, just to complete the animation, if we imagine another tumor, tumor J, and another gene in the cancer pathway mutates first, uh, we get this fitness increase, pathway is off, and the, uh, this first gene, G2, in this case, gets fixated and, and gets mutated, and the other ones not. Okay? Right. So. <laughs> Okay, so, so this is how the cancer pathways show mutually exclusive patterns. We get that already. And now a bunch of, 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 of different groups, uh, different studies started exploiting this phenomenon the other way around. So they started looking for mutually exclusive pathways in the data and, uh, and, and proposed cancer pathway, uh, cancer pathway hypothesis. Okay. So because there is such a lot of these different studies, that I, if I would cite all of them, I, it would get me out of my slide space. So I decided I'm just going to cite people who are in this room. <laughs> so, <clears throat> and so there is a lot of papers uh, with uh, Lyserson as, as the first author, Van Den, uh, Fabio as a, the first author, uh, of course, Ben Raphael uh, around there. Uh, there is a paper from Teresa's, uh, the key metal paper from Teresa Przetyska's group. And there is uh, also uh, our camp, uh, our mutual exclusivity camp from, uh, with papers which originated from Nico's group. Uh, and I'm going to briefly cover two of them uh, here. So, uh, so, so, okay, so the first paper that we uh, uh, published on this, this was uh, our approach, uh, MUX, and this motivation for that approach was that we wanted to propose a, a rigorous statistical model that could provide st significant estimation for these mutual exclusivity patterns. We also saw that, uh, that uh, a lot of mutual exclusivity patterns that were reported in the uh, literature, they seem to us uh, unbalanced. So uh, with one gene uh, highly dominating the entire pattern, which seemed uh, biologically uh, not really relevant. And then we also wanted to take into account the fact that in, uh, in this tumor sequencing data, you have a lot of false negative and false positive mutations. So then we proposed this uh, generative process models, uh, model, which can be illustrated in such steps. So first, you, you choose the, the, the patients which should be covered by the, which, which are covered by the mutual exclusivity pattern uh, with some rate uh, Lambda, and then we have uh, we, we add impurity uh, with rate uh, sigma, and then we have uh, errors, uh, false positives and false negatives. And the graphical representation for that model is, is here. We have uh, some hidden variables, one for the coverage of patients, and one for, um, uh, for choosing which gene uh, should be actually mutually exclusive in a covered patient. And that specifically, as indicated here uh, in the brackets, that variable enforced balanced patterns. So it, it, it strongly enforced that uh, each gene can be the single mutually exclusive limited gene with equal probability. Okay. Um, okay. And then the, we we had a, a, this, the, the significance in this model was computed by via likelihood ratio test where the the, 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 the null model was simply a model which assumed that the genes are independent. So then we analyzed this model in, with increased uh, uh, complexity. So uh, we had some efficient uh, algorithm for S parameter estimation with some uh, assumptions. And then we so showed that the, in the full model, the parameters are identifiable, but not identifiable in practice. So you need basically infin infinitely many <laughs> samples to, to really uh, re um, uh, reliably estimate the parameters. Okay, and then there came a paper uh, from by Simona, which I would like to really uh, point uh, to you because I think it's a very natural uh, approach of show, uh, of representing uh, mutual exclusivity, which has this timing aspect, which a lot of people actually ask for nowadays. So this is uh, our our response to that. So we <coughs> we have the waiting time uh, to. So, okay, we say, okay, every gene gets mutated in specific time in the tumor evolution, right? So there is a waiting time to alteration of gene I, and this waiting time is a random variable, 
which is exponentially distributed with some red, uh, rate lambda i. Uh, we, ha we don't know at which time point of gene evolution the, the, diagnostic, uh, the, the diagnosis happens. So there's this observation time, which is also uh, then a random variable. And uh, and we have the denial model with the two where it's okay the, 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 we are asking now about mutual exclusivity of two genes, and the, in the null model the genes are conditionally independent, uh, given the, these of the observation time and these waiting times, and um, in the mutual exclusivity model this this model is exactly the same as the null model but now here, uh, the, uh, the the genes are not conditionally independent. And their dependence is, is, is governed by this uh, mu parameter, which, <coughs> which when you set it to zero, then you get to the nested uh, null model. But if you set it to one, you get perfect mutual exclusivity. And I'm not going to get into details of that model, but just to point, point you to the, the main uh, message sort of, on, of that model, in the mutual exclusivity model, if we have this, this interesting observation where, where you really have only a single gene, one gene mutated and the other one's not, then the likelihood of that observation in the mutual exclusivity model, this is decomposed into two, into two terms. And the one of them is the, is the term which, which is exactly the same as in the null model. So we, we observe, uh, so, and we observe, so, so we say, okay, we observe that, that single mutation because it just happened before the, observe, the diagnosis. And the other one, uh, the waiting time for the other ones is just later. But, uh, so they would have occurred if we sampled later, okay? So that's no mutual exclusivity. But in the mutual exclusivity case, okay, we, see, we have this, uh, uh, we, we, uh, the other mutations, uh, so th this one mutation happened, but the other mutations, the mutations of other genes could have happened uh, before the observation time, but we, but, uh, we don't uh, see them, right? So the, 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 they don't fixate. So that matches exactly what the, this animation that I showed you in the, in the introduction, okay? So, so that's it um, about mutual exclusivity, uh, which points to cancer pathways, okay? And now I'm going to switch to a completely different aspect of mutual exclusivity, which points to synthetic lethality, which you saw already in the morning. So just to, again, put you into the into right uh, on the board of, of this topic. So we see synthetic lethality. If we, so uh, there is a synthetic lethal interaction between gene A and gene B. If a mutation of gene A gives you cell survival, mutation of gene B alone gives you cell survival. But if you mutate or if you, if you knock out then, uh, two of them, you have cellular death. So this uh, it has been proposed a long time ago already that we can harness synthetic lethal uh, interactions in cancer treatment, and this is because if you in normal cells, if you and if there so if there is inter, uh, this synthetic lethal uh, interaction between gene A and gene B, uh, if you knock out any of these genes in normal cells, you, these normal cells survive, but in the cancer cells, one of these genes is already mutated. So if you inhibit the other one, you exploit this genetic interaction, and you have cellular death specifically of the tumor cells and not of the normal cells. And that, uh, a very famous example for that is the BRCA1 or 2 and PARP1. And the PARP1 inhibitors are, are already around in, in, in uh, uh, exploiting that uh, uh, interaction. So, okay, so... I'm just going to repeat, maybe, the discovery of synthetic lethal interactions is extremely difficult, so the experimental approaches are over, overwhelmed by the combinatorial number of, of all possible pairs of human genes and, uh, you know, different tissues and so on. So there have been studies with, which focus on one, experimental studies which focus on one prominent cancer gene and screen for interaction partners of that one gene, or which otherwise limit the to uh, or which limit somehow this testing input uh, in any other way like for example uh, just sorry just take uh, testing um, t just testing uh, dna repair genes and now the computational uh, there there were lots of different uh, sl prediction uh, computational sl prediction approaches but the ones that I want to point you to are, uh, are ones that combine different sources of ed evidence from different kinds of data. So 
so this is an overview from paper which you have seen already in the morning by Eitan, from Eitan Rupin's group. So the idea is, okay, we're going to combine all these different uh, data sets. We're going to mine for, uh, for synthetic lethal uh, interactions. We're going to get this cancer synthetic lethality network and then maybe add uh, additional patient information and, in, and hopefully predict uh, gene essentiality, drug responses, and cl clinical prognosis. Okay, so uh, one approach I, I want to review is um, uh, by Lou et al. from Nature Communications for, from 2013, which had some somewhat indirect uh, discovery uh, of SL interactions from you know, from uh, not from experimental data, but from uh, from a different data set. So they were looking at evolutionary events. So they were basically building phylogenetic species trees, and they were decorating them with presence of, or absence, so like gene losses or, or gains. And then from there, they were um, inferring via machine learning approaches asymmetric dependency interactions, and then looking for. Uh, negative genetic interactions between human genes in general, not cancer-specific. And then they needed additional data, yet additional data, that could pinpoint them to select tumor-specific uh, predictions. Now, um, what we have done uh, in, in our work, and of course what you, ha you have seen already from uh, Eitan, uh, Eitan to today in the morning, uh, other approaches <coughs> look at gene mutation expression clinical data which comes from tumors, okay, directly from, like TCGA, right, from directly from tumor genomic data and is already tumor specific. So what we have done, we, will, uh, we combine different uh, types of genomic data, point mutations, copy number variants, gene expression, with survival, and, 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 and uh, we were specifically we looked for mutual exclusivity, um, confirmation survival data, we ranked uh, uh, the candidate gene pairs accordingly, and then we assigned uh, in significance to these uh, findings using Cox models. So, <clears throat> so the first criterion for us for detecting SL gene pairs from the genomic and clinical data, the first criterion for us was, of course, this mutual exclusivity. So. <clears throat> We looked, so we divided the, the set of tumors that, that we had at hand into four groups. Uh, one of them, G1, was where the first gene in the pair is mutated only. And the, the G2 would be uh, another group of, of tumors where the second gene is mutated only. And then a third group would be both, where both of them are mutated at the same time. And of course, from the basic definition of synthetic lethality, you expect that if, the, if G1 and G2 are synthetic lethal, then you want that both group is underrepresented in the data given the, the, the frequency of mutations of, of these two genes. So this can be assessed with a hypergeometric test. And for a pure uh, uh, synthetic lethality, of course, the, the both group could be uh, essentially uh, also just zero. Um, but, the, but, but, of course, you have loads of mutual exclusivity pairs uh, in tumor data, okay? You, 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 and, of course, not all of them will be synthetic lethal. So what we also imposed as a, as a second criteria, criterion was that we wanted that the, that the individual uh, uh, mutations would be good or neutral for tumors and bad or neutral for patients, and the both group not only would be underrepresented, but also bad for tumors and good for patients. And bad for tumors just means, yeah, it's synthetic diesel, right? So they should be worse off than having either of these two genes um, uh, mutated, and then the, then the good and bad would be assessed with patient survival. And how was that uh, exactly done? So we, we were plotting these Kaplan-Meier plots for, for the four groups, for the both G1, G2, and neither, which was treated then as a reference. And we were looking at the, just the, 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 the survival function, which is represented in the Kaplan-Meier plot. And to summarize these, these, these survival functions, we used uh, simply the, um, the area under these curves, these survival functions. And this area under these curves, this is very natural, right? So the, the, the larger the area, the more up are these survival functions, so the better. 
but of course, this natural race of summary exists in in, in survival analysis, and that it, it even has a name, restricted mean lifetime. This is simply area under the survival curve. So we were computing these mean and restricted lifetimes for the three groups, G1, G2, and both, because we wanted to compare them. So then the fitness of patients in any of these three groups would be how well they are doing in terms of their survival as compared to the reference. And now we assumed, okay, we have to have some proxy for the fitness of tumors, okay? So that would be just the inverse fitness of patients. So the better the tumor is, go, is, is off, the, the worse the patients are off, and, and, and the other way around. So then we had, um, and then we comp uh, proposed this SL score, which would be actually a direct uh, derivative of the, uh, of the definition of a negative interaction. So this is the di divergence from additivity of, the, of, of fitnesses, right? So we, were comp we had a ratio of the fitness of the both group, where both of them are mutated, and, um, and what would be expected from the individual frequencies. So it was a log of uh, fitness of both and the, pro uh, and the ratio divided by the product of the fitnesses of the two groups. So that, scores, uh, that score was used to rank our candidate uh, interaction pairs, our synthetic lethal interaction pairs. So the ones that were on the top, they were showing this, the, this largest uh, sort of surprise in terms of genetic interaction. And then to, uh, to assess significance of these interactions, we were using Cox models, which were getting also, uh, taking into account also um, the impact of other known, well-known predictions like age, the predictors like age of the, of the patients. Okay, so that was our work. You saw work by, by, uh, by eight, from Aitan's group. And, they, they, uh, and I, I'm just uh, showing you again uh, a picture from their paper. Because I, I just want to say, I just want to ask, how well now c can we uh, do in general in predicting these uh, synthetic lethality pairs? And uh, one way to assess it is like like uh, like they done in this paper. So you can basically try to, try to validate your predictions with experimentally verified gene pairs, and um, there they had um, synthetic lethal pairs, non-synthetic lethal interactions, and. A synthetic dosage lethal altogether, 7, 000 to, uh, around 7,000 gene pairs, both positive and negative cases. And okay, the, the, the DAISY approach you see uh, is, is, is in blue, it goes like here. But in general, it has the, the, uh, it, the, the most important component to the prediction are, is taking two sources of knowledge, SOF, which is essentially mutual exclusivity, and the co-expression of genes, okay? So this is how well you can do. Uh, so a, a student of mine, uh, Ola Novak, uh, just to, uh, we wanted just to focus on synthetic lethality. So forget about the uh, synthetic dosage uh, um, lethality. Uh, she focused on SL only. So that selected for uh, uh, that actually left only 800 known gene pairs, uh, synthetic lethal gene pairs, and only 15 true positives. So there's much more, much less true positives for synthetic lethality than synthetic dosage lethality. And he tried to replicate uh, the DAISY approach, uh, of course, uh, as good as, as we could. But in general, I'm actually pretty convinced that it's, it's harder to predict synthetic lethality than synthetic dosage lethality. And there is room for improvement in synthetic uh, lethality prediction. So the AUC is, is lower. And in general, synthetic dosage lethality, of course, you could better, uh, do better as well. So what we are working on now at the moment is um, to extend the evidence sources even more. So I, I believe in, in, this, in, in combining all these data sources for improved predictions. So in particular, we are looking, uh, we are inspired by this paper by Luerl. We want to look uh, also at these evolutionary absence presence patterns, uh, mine uh, protein-protein interaction networks, and look for specific uh, uh, motifs in these, uh, in these networks which could predict negative uh, genetic interactions. Uh, so with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And I want to thank Nico, uh, Simona for, uh, for the mutual exclusivity work, and Navodid and uh, Martin for the uh, synthetic <laughs> lethality work, and, uh, and Ola Novak, uh, who is working now on, on, the, on the synthetic lethality project. So thank you very much. Questions?
So your SL score, that looked exactly like what we would call epistasis. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. So, so why does it capture only negative um, interactions, which is what you're looking for? That should also pick up positive ones, no? I think that there has to be some sign, so if it's um, one way or the, the positive or negative, then you would expect this ratio to be, sorry, either larger or negative or smaller than zero, than one, right? So yeah, I'm looking only in one direction, of course, yes. Uh -huh. Ultimately, the, the impact of, of the genes pairs that you choose um, the treatment outcomes are affected by the actual treatment. So, uh, you actually uh, look at uh, drugs, what kind of yeah. control, yeah, what the drugs are. Um, no. are so, in, the, in, this, in this work, no? Uh, no. Is that in the plan? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. So, I have a question about independence model assumption. Mm -hmm. Does the independence uh, take into account? Uh, in which of our models? In the, in the, 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 the first model. Mm -hmm. It estimates the frequency of mutations directly from the page. It, 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 it exactly is estimated by taking the frequency of mutations. Wow. So the likelihood in this model is just computed as a, as a product yeah. of these frequencies. The of, the gene of, the gene, of the gene across patients. Gene across patients, yes. but without correcting for mutation rate of patients. Without. Yes. Mm -hmm. One more question. Yes. Can you generalize this score to more than two genes? Uh, this? Yeah. So, I look at triplets and mm -hmm. see whether, mm -hmm. uh, you know, advantage yeah. of them being mutated, etc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> I would have to think first of a model of, a, so not a model, of like an explanation, what we find uh, surprising in the sense of uh, what is interaction between three. It's like, is it only what you don't expect as additive interaction between three and then compare it to all of them? Or do you have uh, more, you know, like um, other aspects of this combi combined interaction? There could be actually, you know, other things going on between more than two, <laughs> right? But maybe you could. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.